Well, my earliest memories, I guess, is um, when we were in a tent in what was called Davis's Orchard on the field there that would be before number four grounds. And we had a, a tent in, in the field there. And uh, I, I don't know whether my dad rented the space from the Davises or whether they just allowed you to stay there. I, I have no idea, but that's my first memories. <laughs> when my dad leased this property, my mother nearly had a fit because she said, how are we ever going to afford to build a cabin? We don't have any money. And he said, oh, well, we'll manage. And he finally got together and ordered this material for the cottage, but he couldn't afford the shingles because they were quite expensive. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know how they were going to get a roof on this place. And uh, one morning, we lived in Vancouver here, just up the street here. One morning, my mom got up in the morning, and there was a load of shingles in her backyard. No. <laughs> and she never <laughs> did know who paid for them. Oh. It was one of her relatives or yeah. brother-in-laws or something. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but birthday. somebody Here's delivered the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she never did it till the day she died, found out who paid for these shingles. But some, mm -hmm. somebody <laughs> delivered them to her backyard. My Uncle Joe built the place, and um, we uh, moved in on the, it was the 1st of July. Right after school. In uh, 1923. And I remember my mom saying it was pouring rain when they were putting the roof on, and she was cooking on the wooden coal stove, and all the drips were. Oh, no. All over. Yeah. <laughs> Till they finally got the yeah, roof on. That answers the question of mine about uh, cooking. We had a wooden yeah, yeah, wooden coal stove. stove. And, and Did that also heat the place where mm -hmm. you had an air tight? It was basically one big room. Mm -hmm. It had. Um, one short petition between the bedrooms and then mm -hmm. curtains. Oh, yeah. That, that was it. Then that, and then the, the other was kitchen area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was, that was the cottage. Kitchen area, so that had a sink or? No. You didn't have water. No, we never had running water. water. We out. didn't even ever have power. It, they got it right up to the house next door, but we didn't want it. I mean, this was not our idea of... You were camping. We were camping, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that meant what, kerosene heaters, mm -hmm. kerosene, kerosene lamps? lamps kerosene lamps, yeah. And we used to go over to the creek uh, between number four and five grounds. Right. There was, right. yeah, there yeah. was water down at the picnic tables. Oh, and there was an old well down there when we were kids. And we oh, used to have to take that. water yeah. down to pump, to prime it. And then we packed our water up in buckets. Mm -hmm. And Mondays, my sister and I spent all day packing water. Mm -hmm. And of course, right. we played with these buckets and tried out the gravity. And half the time we got back with a quarter of a bucket, you know. <laughs> 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 and then they got water in down at the picnic table, so we used to go down there and get our water there. The water top. But, uh, yeah. We, yeah, but uh, we got a lot of our water from the creek just across the field there. It was mm -hmm. more exciting mm -hmm. dipping it out of the creek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, all the cottages were there, but it was so beautiful, and there were, you know, all the, the fruit trees, and I remember there was a, a big, big cherry tree right at the top. You went up these stairs, and on this side was number one, and it went like this, and yours was number 12 at the back, and then went over this way, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And I used to sit up in that tree and eat these cherries. I'm surprised I didn't get a <laughs> terrible stomachache. And then there were the apple trees, there were the plum trees, and it was, you know what it was wonderful for were people who couldn't afford a summer cabin somewhere. They had a wonderful time. Or you might get two families together. Or you had mm -hmm. people that would go up every summer for two weeks and they'd always the same yeah, cabin. The same one. And then all the company picnics that used to go up there, you know, the different unions, oh, just big stores that went up. And on, uh, or even Wednesdays, and especially on the weekends, they would have their company picnics. It's amazing that, that the thousands of people that used to get on that island during the course of the day and without the island going under or something from the weight of it all. But when you got the big picnics up, you know, longshoremen's and, and woodwards, and mm -hmm. they were, it was all a big picnics, I guess, for the style in those days. These huge company picnics. And there were six picnic grounds, and, and uh, all the picnic grounds would be, you know, they'd be all occupied sometimes on this. And, uh, There'd be masses and masses of people there and all this activity going on. So, oh, as uh, you know, kids living on the island there, they uh, always used to figure they ought to be able to take part in races and win prizes and, and uh, get, ice, <laughs> get ice cream cones, get pop. You <laughs> bet. Yeah, anything, that, anything that was there, well, we should have yeah. as, as much rights as these other people did. Yeah. And um, a lot of the, most of the people were pretty generous, too. They didn't, uh, they didn't really worry too much.
Where, local color where things or... went. Yeah. Well, the local color, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Eddie was pretty good. He used to win a lot of races. I wasn't, he, he was always coming back with loot, but I wasn't quite as good. We went everywhere on that island when we were kids. We hiked to Mount Gardner, we hiked to Tunstall, we went everywhere. Did you? Uh, hiking to Tunstall, that's quite a trek. Yeah, it was. And, then, and up the mountain, that's strange. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, but we used to go over to Mount Gardner Park, mm -hmm. we went over to Grafton Bay, we had our bikes up there and we used to mm -hmm. bike around. and. Diving off the dock was a really good entertainment. <laughs> it was lots of fun. And swimming at uh, Sandy Beach at that time was was all was our beach. Uh, the kids on Bowen, that, we had it pretty well segregated. Bowen kids would be at Sandy Beach, and the um, Deep Bay kids we were only summer kids. They'd have Pebbly, and oh. we'd sort of hurl insults across the beaches at each other because mm -hmm. <laughs> there was always a rivalry between the summer kids and the Bowen kids. It was very very uh, ingrained, very felt, uh, very deeply about. Um, and monetarily, it was it was rich and the poor. Really. Yeah. And the summer kids were had had the boats, had the skis, the, the and the Bowen kids had you know whatever we could scrounge. <laughs> Did Stella tell you we met at Bowen Island? No, I haven't 52, heard that. Fifty-two years ago. I haven't heard that story. <laughs> it's not a story. It's a fact. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like there's more to it than that. <laughs> Met in Bowen Island, not during one of those Saturday night dances. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Do you remember the 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 uh, the booze cruise and all of that stuff? <laughs> the people coming yeah, over. I used to get in for free, <laughs> but I didn't get. I didn't dance. I mean, I I just got up on a, one of the benches in the corners. Uh, I remember standing up there with Jackie Bowden half the time, so you could look down on the crowd and watch them, because they used to do the Charleston, all that sort of stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and of course, most of, like, the Collins and the McGee's, all, they weren't allowed to go down. Hmm. Uh, but I, I just went, that's all. I mean, nobody ever bothered me, but I had three miles to walk home afterwards. Oh, wow. Midnight, but I want, they used to go around with a union truck, pick up all the bodies from under the trees. And just take them and lay them on the deck. <laughs> that's, that's why that's, they call it the booze crew. So that's people who had been drinking too much. Yes. And who had what, missed the boat or something? No, they didn't miss the boat. The Union steamship made sure they got them on the boat by going and picking them up with a truck. Oh, I see. Lay them in the truck like a bunch of cordwood. <laughs> carry them up the gangplank and plunk them on the deck. That's what I used to stand and watch. And then when the boat backed out is what I liked. Yeah. It used to, the, the orchestra used to play till it went out away around the point. And it sounded so pretty. And the fellow that had the orchestra, we called him Skinny Goodman. But I wonder what his real name was, I don't know. Yeah. We called him Skinny Goodman. You know, strange things, though, can happen to you and very innocently, too, you know, because I remember I was at the dance one night and I was with this big, tall fellow. Oh, he's a good-looking guy. He died on Bone Island. He broke his neck diving in the sandy beach. And we we were going out that. outside the, the dance hall, and he was one who liked his rum, you know. So he thought it was rum time, I guess. So he said, would you please come with me up here and hold my glass for me because I want to drink a rum. So I thought, oh, that's a, nothing harm, no harm in that. So I went out with him, and I was holding this cup for him to fill for him for to have his rum. I didn't drink any. And uh, just then, you know, girls come along the road and they say, oh, oh, Nora Rivet, I see you in there. Oh. You know, and, and Holly's great. I'm going to tell you about that. My daughter is older. And we locked her in the house all the time. You know? <laughs> she was a very pretty girl. And uh, 12, and uh, on Saturday nights, when the Union steamship, the booze crews would come up. Oh, yes. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't let her out. <laughs> and again, she couldn't understand why her brother could. And I said, he's not going either. So anyway, uh, <laughs> they stayed home. But I can remember watching one. We all used to go down to watch the booze crews come in. I bet. You know, that was a big event. Huge. <laughs> yeah. Huge go to watch the booze cruise tonight? Yeah, come on now. <laughs> so we would go down, and I can remember this one poor man trying to get off of the ship. <laughs> the police, they I guess they were hired by Union Steamship, but 
they did, yeah, they did have a police. And <laughs> he wasn't there much during the week because we did cause a lot of trouble. But on the booze cruise, well, anyway, he was on the wharf. And this poor guy's trying to get down the gangplank to get off. But he's too drunk, so they won't let him on the island, so they send him back. And they don't want him on the ship because he's too, he spent the whole night going back and forth. I don't know what happened to him. We finally left. <laughs> that was the excitement for that night. <laughs> you know, they gave those Saturday night dances such a, a bad name. Oh, did they get a bad name? Well, I, I, that, I've yeah. heard a lot of people, you know, say, oh, those the booze cruises. I yeah, the booze that. cruises. Yeah. They never went any, they didn't disrupt the island one little bit because they went from the boat to the dance hall and mm -hmm. back to the boat. Sounds a little bit like Bone Island and Brody, a little bit. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually it was entertainment for us. We used to walk, go down every Saturday night and watch the people come off and if we were lucky well, enough to... And, and at uh, midnight Johnny Cameron always used to dive off the boat on its way out and they played uh, <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be one of the trumpeters up on the deck. It was lovely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we quite enjoyed it. So a lot it. of the locals, a lot of the people, it wasn't just the, the people on the boats that enjoyed the, the, the dances and the entertainment. A yeah, lot a lot of the people the out there did, yeah. The one thing that people tend to, it seems to me, always gets overlooked on, on all of these histories and so on, is <laughs> that uh, Bowen Island is that. It was just a terrific party place, you know. I mean, the parties that went on there on a Saturday night around the place, and that was the whole, mm -hmm. the whole, Pro idea of the whole project, you know, was to, to go out and have a good time. Mm -hmm. It was, it was really well, especially the fifties. Oh after yeah, the war, particularly you the 50s, see. It was just so the people party. that lived up there were party people. Oh, they're party people. I mean, up, and then the boats you know, would come in, and oh, yes, know, they'd be yes. partying, and they'd be dancing at the dance hall, and then they, you know, you go down and see the boat off after, and they just have sing songs. That was time to go on the house parties. And it, it really until was. the and hotel closed and, in the fifties. You know, did you originally discover the, the social, like the dancing and that type of thing? Is that what you lured you over? I Why did all young men come to Bowen Island? See, that, that was it, eh? That was yeah. kind of... Well, sure. Yeah. And that's where, that's where all the action was on the weekends. How did you end up on board? My dad saw an ad in the paper for ferry captains for the little sannies that used to come to Bowen Island. And he loved the sea. He had been in the Navy. And so he applied for the job, was accepted. And they moved us over here just before I was four, and uh, here we stayed. The job that he had with the Sani, was that, did it turn out to be a full-time job then? Yes, it was. It was, um, it was a real going concern at the time. They were running all year round. They ran oh, 10, 11, 12 trips a day, back and forth to Horseshoe Bay, 25 cents per trip. And they used to come in not only to Snug Cove, but to Hood Point, Miller's Landing, Seymour Bay. They travel all to all around the island because there was no paved roads or no roads <coughs> that went right across the island. So the Sannies were the only way of getting over here, apart from private boat. And it was full time uh, winter. They used to get out there in some real wild storms, but they were very sturdy little boats and uh, managed to make it back and forth. With uh, we had a few boats run aground and and get lost in storms, but always came back. And <laughs> no <laughs> loss of life the whole entire time I was. Li uh, living there and, and having dad work on the boats. He was let go just a year before the the whole system fell apart when Union Steamships ground to a halt. Mm. And the Black Ball Ferry took over the following year after he, he lost the job with the Sannies. And by that time then he turned to being working on the road crew. That was his next job on Bowen. Well, Tommy White ran the Sannies and uh, he usually had a helper. Lyle Davies would take one. He had several Sannies going at a time, the, uh -huh. the Sanny 3, Sanny 4, and the Samina. And uh, they were running back and forth to Horseshoe Bay, and occasionally they'd bring a run up to Scarborough and drop people off. They were, well, you've got pictures of them, they were yeah. in a long flat boat with them. Um, they, they did have canvas curtains that rolled down. If it got really sloppy and the waves were flying inside, then they could drop the curtains and keep the water from Soaking you. How the long did the trip take? Oh, it was only a, it was only a short trip, maybe twenty five minutes, half an hour. Oh yeah. Yeah, wasn't wasn't too long. The price was twenty five cents, which is pretty good, I guess. Sure. But Tommy White owned them and ran them pretty well all his life, and towards the end, I think they were they were bought out by the Union Steamships. But Tommy continued to run them. Mm -hmm. Ed Davies used to take one, and Lyle Davies used to take one. And there, there was others. 
And Tommy married later in life. He married a lady, and I don't know her maiden name, but her name was Mary, Mary White. And uh, she used to take one occasionally too. Like they worked together, and so uh, and she, she she must be dead now, I would think. But I she lived outlived Tommy quite a few years. She lived in the North Shore. In fact, I think she they fixed one of the boats up. It might have been the Samina. They fixed one up to live in, like to travel around the coast after oh. he sort of retired. Oh, yeah. And he and Mary would go, and they were living in, um, what do you call that place in in North Van at the far, the far Deep end? Cove? Deep Cove. They lived, they used to tie up in Deep Cove, and uh, in the summer <coughs> they'd be out traveling up and down the coast. And so she outlived Tommy, and then I suppose, I don't know whether she continued to live on the boat or whether she sold the boat, and, and then... Uh, Any ideas where I can get my hands on a Sani, or...? There's still a... You mean a, a picture? Uh, one now? Yeah, one still now. Around? There's still around. Well, I'm sure there's there are some around. I have seen, in fact, a number of years ago, I think Tommy, he had the Sani 2, and I have an idea, somebody bought that one and refurbished it mm -hmm. and used it as a pleasure boat for a number of years. Probably the one that Tommy fixed up is still on the go, too, but I haven't seen one. But if you ever saw one, you'd know that it was a Sani. They used to have a Union boat. They used to have a Friday night boat, and they called it the Father's Special. And <laughs> <laughs> the dad come back after the yeah, they'd come up yeah. on Friday. They said the Union steamships ran a special boat on Friday yeah. evenings. It was 7.30. And, yeah, perfect time. Yeah. Right after work. And my dad used to bring up uh, whatever groceries he could pack. And, and always a new pair of running shoes every week because we'd run through them. <laughs> They were only a dollar a piece at that time. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite memory of, of traveling to the mainland? Well, I guess it would be with the Sani at the time. Oh, yes. The Sani was always uh, from the time we were we till even when we brought our first born to Bowen. Yeah, we, Tell them that story. Well, that's a lovely story. We were married and we brought our first child across in the Sani and we had her in a basket. Her name was Linda. And Ed Davies saw us, and he went to the people in the front seat, and he said, I'm sorry, you'll have to move. I brought her over as a baby, and now I'm bringing her daughter over as a baby. Wow. And that baby has the first seat in the sky. What brought your family to uh, Bone Island? Why did they decide to move to Bone Island? It seems quite obscure. Well, uh, my mother's family, the, the Smiths, had the, all the property around Lake oh, Kalani, oh. and then there's the McGee's and the Collins. Right. And Dad was looking for a job, but uh, and there was work. <laughs> and, there. and yeah, and there and there weren't that many jobs about, I guess, in '26. And perhaps not in the city. Mm. No. Because mm -hmm. everyone always has a different story about moving yes, to well, Bowen, don't they? Mm -hmm. But there was all. Well, I I ended up had 19 first cousins right right there when I moved there. So <laughs> big family. Yeah. So immediately, I imagine family picnics and. Uh, does that? No, we just get uh, together. Just get together, almost. You know. I mean, most of my playmates were cousins. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When half the island was my family, you couldn't very well avoid them. Oh, that sounds them, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, that sounds wonderful. I think there was some attempt to have a Boy Scout movement, but not many people wanted to join it, because we, we did everything anyway. We were just, you know, we, uh, well, in the summer, it was ten tennis and swimming and sailing, and then mm -hmm. hunting and fishing in the winter, so we didn't. Mm -hmm. didn't so there really wasn't no, any dull no, moments. No, but there was a community hall right down the, uh, you know where the causeway is, where, right. and then there's a number one picnic ground, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, there was a hall there, and they, played, they had badminton, and they had, they had uh, odds and ends mm -hmm. of, of entertainment there. Mm -hmm. And of course, the annual school <laughs> plays. <laughs> of course. And I know my uh, my dad always got. In those days, you could get three deer in the fall, and we always had. He he always got three deer. We we would on the front porch. We he'd have the he, uh, he quartered them up in the legs, leg, a leg of deer hanging there, and he'd get um, cheesecloth and wrap them, mm -hmm. wrap them in cheesecloth and hang them up. They'd be hanging on the front porch. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you could go out there and take a take a leg down, and you could carve yeah. big roasts or whatever you want off it. Oh, Another thing that happened there, too, uh, one year we we gathered up windfalls in, over by the um, hotel, uh, around the, yeah. uh, they had orchards over that way too. Yeah. And we gathered up a whole bunch of these sheep noses over there, apples, and we got a press squeezer, 
Right. And we crushed and pr pressed all this stuff. And he had a whole barrel, a wooden barrel, that fitted underneath the, the table in the kitchen. You know, it just slid under. Mm -hmm. or in fact, it didn't slide. He got in there and mm -hmm. had it, and I just a cloth over it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what he did, but it's full of apple juice, and it stayed there for quite, quite a while. And you know, it turned out just like turned out just like champagne. You could take it. You, <laughs> it, 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 it was hard. Wine. It was it was delicious. You know, really, one you could take a <laughs> cup and look at it, and it would just be fizzing on top. Oh boy! Bubbles, you know. Yeah. Just, I don't know if if anybody you know really tried to do it, it'd probably go. You'd have a barrel full of vinegar, but this but it was, was just just the right whatever he did. It was just right. <laughs> <laughs> so that year they had a we made up for the vinegar. They had, they, yeah, right. It was it was really uh, quite a drink. Again. Do you think other people have tried to make their own? Uh, oh yeah, I'm sure wines they did. Yeah, the first year, the second year, about 1936, Lake Clarney froze up for. I don't know, six or seven week period, oh, and the stunning. ice the ice was actually between 16 and 18 inches thick. Right down, yeah. You know, about, about oh, that yeah. thick. And, and you could build, we used to build fires out on the lake, right on the ice, and, and you'd be out there skating and it, uh, freezing it nothing and boom like and it. crack it across the ice. Oh. Yeah, it was, but it was quite a little jaunt to go out to Lake Clarney from, you know, from the cove. But I lived here till I was 18. Took my four years of high school by correspondence. How did that work? Oh, I thought it was great. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> there wasn't mm -hmm. any alternative. It was either that or move to Vancouver and stay with my aunt. And that wasn't an option. And there were only a few of us taking mm -hmm. correspondence. Uh, I meant by how did that work? Did you work at home? I worked at home most of the time, and we'd go to school when we were writing our exams. Oh, I because see. Because they had to be supervised. I see. And, uh, but basically, we worked from home. Discipline. I guess so, yes, and when you learn something, I, I st <laughs> it was there to stay. <laughs> I was on the ferry, and um, I had presto logs in the trunk of my car, so it was well back. And on the ferry, a man came over, and he said, Madam, you have a flat tire. And I, oh, my gosh. Gee, can I get it up to the garage? Now, the garage, in those days, was just beyond where the you go into the post office, a sort of flat area. Oh, yes. That yes. was the garage. So I got the car and I thought, well, I've got to set, even if I have to sacrifice a tire, i got to get it off the ferry. That's right. So I got it. We had no BCAA or anything yeah. in those days. So I got it up there, and I went in, and I said, um, I've got a flat. And he said, oh, and I said, yes. I said, I wonder if you could fix it for me. Sorry, we don't do flats on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> a grad. Mm. So, fortunately, there were a couple of fellows there who heard this, mm. and they very kindly, but to get into the flat, the other tire, we had to unload all the presto logs. Oh, no. And then, after we got finished, then reload all the press lies, but I thought the prices, and I've told that story many times, and we don't change tires on Saturday afternoons. With the Union Steamships folding in the mid-50s, it, it changed the island a lot, because it, uh, as soon as the hotel went, there was less and less people, and even in the summertime, the whole place very got very, very quiet, and it was very, uh, looked to the point of dying during the 60s, it was, it was very depressed area really there was there's nothing happening in the summer and people just had their own cabins that they came up to and the whole island sort of was very fractured at that point because they didn't have the focal point of the union to come up to to go to the hotel use the facilities the swimming pool the tennis courts everything just sort of faded away hmm. changed the whole aspect of the island i lived in a little cottage in deep bay um and a couple of years later, ended up living in the Alder Grove in one of the old Union Steamship cottages there. And that was uh, uh, before the GVRD? Yeah, it was about five years, I guess, before the GVRD took over. It was a little bit different than the Orchard Cottages. It was, um, I think it was perhaps one of the earliest cottages built. It was almost two stories. So would you say it was a solid house then? Really solid. Yeah, I lived in the Alder Grove until the GVRD took over, and when they took over, they came in and they tested all the septics. Mm. And um, when mm. we failed, they gave us our eviction notices, and we all moved out and they tore the cabins down. 
And at that point, there were some empty cottages in the orchard, so I moved over here, and Edie Hannon moved over here. When I first came in here, I was in 14, um, and I was in there for about five years until the GVRD, uh, right, once again, came around, tested the septics, and evicted four of us. And that's another story. There was one cabin that was vacant, number 17, and because I had been in the orchard the longest, then I was given uh, preference for that cabin. Suzanne, can you tell me a leaky roof story? I can tell you many leaky roof stories. Okay. Um, when I lived in cabin number 14 in the orchard, I used to have bowls that ran all the way across the living room floor, touching each other to catch the leaks that came down from the uh, from the skylight that went all the way across the ceiling. Now I just have them in my bathroom on the windowsill, which they fill up rather quickly. quickly. Yes. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with musical. Uh, they didn't have different sound levels. Well, when you got really bored, you did that. <laughs> Yes, there were, there were like-minded people around you. That was that was a ni one of the nicest things. There were here people that you knew would support you, people that you could borrow things from. I mean, you know, there was always your neighbors were your friends, and um, you know, if you wanted someone to visit, you had someone to visit. Yet, if you wanted your privacy, uh, you were left alone. People didn't uh, didn't take advantage of the fact that they lived right next door to you. Mm. You know, they respected your space, which was kind of necessary in this this uh, crowded little area. Yeah. So it was, it was just a marvelous time. It's a very special place, and there's memories, I'm sure, that hundreds of people have of the orchard cottages. It was so rural. People talk about being sort of rural now, and they want to keep the rural atmosphere and so on. And that's, you know, that's, that's fine. But, I mean, it essentially was very rural in the, uh, in the 30s. You knew everybody. You never locked your door. Turn your world over upside down yeah and that's what it was like yeah. and that's what we miss